a different tech, couple of different techniques for balancing equations. You can see the representation here of uh, reactants combining, making products. This could very well represent a reaction involving hydrogen and oxygen. And you can see the particles, the molecules. And we always, in chemical reactions, we combine reactants into products. And notice that the same number of particles have to be accounted for on reactant and product side, or else we do not fulfill the um, basic tenet of science that says matter can't be created or destroyed, but simply rearranged. So no atoms are lost in the process. So here's a little more complicated chemical reaction. What we have here is a, is a um, combustion chamber. We have ethanol, C2H5OH. Uh, we're feeding in a stream of oxygen in the reaction chamber, and we have enough oxygen so that the ethanol burns completely in what we call a complete combustion. In a complete combustion, there's enough oxygen to make CO2 and water. If it were an incomplete combustion, we would make carbon monoxide and water, or we would make carbon and water. And that would happen if we would run out of oxygen. You'll ever notice when you're burning something on a barbecue and it starts emitting black smoke, simply because you're not getting enough air going in there. So, and again, we can see the number of particles in the left here. And uh, they, if you take a look, we'd have the same number of particles on the right. So to balance the equation, I'm gonna show you this technique, Caleb, where if we have two carbons on the left, we can, we can put a two coefficient here and we, cannot, we can't change formulas when we balance equations because uh, that would change the nature of the substance. Carbon dioxide is always CO2, never changes, but we can create two carbon dioxide molecules to balance for carbon since there's two carbons on this side in, in the ethanol molecule, which is right here. So now once we balance carbon, uh, next thing I'm gonna do is Typically, I like to work from a balanced formula to an unbalanced formula, but in this case, oxygen is the other element. And since oxygen is in four places, I'm not gonna balance oxygen next. It's gonna sit to the last. So now I'm gonna look at hydrogen and count the hydrogens on the left. You can see there's six. So in order to make six hydrogens on the right, we need three waters to give me six hydrogens. And now the last thing we're gonna do is balance oxygen. So we can see we have four oxygens here and three, that's seven. We have one oxygen there, so we need six here. So we're gonna multiply that by three. And that's the technique I'm gonna show you a little further in detail uh, that I'm gonna to use to balance simple equations. And I'll show you a more complicated method of balancing equations as well, for ones that don't balance easily this way, okay? So in this case, oxygen is in excess. The ethanol is the limiting reagent. Um, we put it in there and when it's uh, consumed completely, the reaction stops. And it's the ethanol that's gonna determine how much carbon dioxide and water is produced. So now um, in a chemical reaction, we know that a chemical change has happened where new substances are formed. Typically what happens, you can get a color change. Uh, you can form a new solid that wasn't there before, like a precipitate when you combine two uh, solutions together. You can uh, release a gas into the air. Um, or if there's a large temperature change, it gets either really hot or really cold. Those are all different uh, obs observations that are make, made when chemical reactions occur. So a balanced equation always has the same number of atoms on each side. It always represents the initial and final states of the substances involved. <clears throat> and it usually does not represent the actual chemical process involved. It's the total of all the elementary steps going on. So in a chemical reaction, typically there are intermediate steps that we're not gonna address really until 132 when you talk about reaction rates. We're all only gonna look at the overall chemical equation for the overall reaction, not its steps. So, and we can use the balance equation to actually determine the relationships between reactions and products in a process called stoichiometry. We're gonna show you that today. So. To balance simple equations, you wanna make sure all the formula are correct. And we've been learning naming to ensure you know how to write formula. Um, so what you're gonna do is balance elements appearing in the fewest number of places first, and then work from there. So uh, when choosing the next element, it must be found in one of the formulas. 
containing a previously balanced element unless that element is present in, in the most places, which is what I did in the last example. So, and you can use fractional coefficients to balance um, because we're dealing really with molar quantities. So here's my first example. So if I have four aluminums on the left, I'm gonna look and see aluminum's only in two places, so I could start with it. Carbon is in two places. I could very well have started with it. Hydrogen is in two places, three places. So I'm not gonna use hydrogen. Oxygen is in two places. In this case, I could have started with that, but I'm gonna just start with the aluminum. So if you can see there's four aluminums on this side, so how do I balance the aluminum? I use a check mark to indicate where it is I'm balancing, I see I have four aluminums. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, look and see, since this formula is already balanced, I'm gonna move next to oxygen because it's only in two places. Hydrogen is in three places, so I'm not gonna use the hydrogen. So in this case, we have 12 oxygens. So to balance it, we're gonna need 12 waters. And now if everything's working well, we can assume that C hydrogen is in three places, but carbon is only in two places. So I'm gonna follow that rule. It says I'm gonna to go to the element that's in fewer places first. Carbon is in only in two places. So if there's three carbons, I'm gonna make three CH4s, also called methane, to balance the carbons. And now the hydrogen should take care of itself. So the last thing we're gonna do is check the hydrogens. There's three times four, there's 12 hydrogens here three times four, 12 hydrogens here for a total of 24 hydrogens. In this case, 12 times two is 24 hydrogens. So we have successfully balanced this equation. Now, if I'm gonna balance the next one, magnesium, I can see again, magnesium is in two places. Oxygen is in four places. Hydrogen is in two places. So I'm not gonna balance oxygen till the end. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so now what I'm gonna do, I can also see that phosphates are not changed. We have a phosphate here and a phosphate here. And I can actually use that whole phosphate particle as a single particle when balancing. So in this case, if I start with the phosphates, I can see I have two phosphates on the right. If I put a two here, I have two phosphates on the left. And now once I balance the phosphorus or the phosphates, um, now what I'm gonna do is balance a hydrogen because it's in that same formula that's partially balanced. And it's only in two places. So we have six hydrogens. So what number multiplied by two is six here? It's three. Now again, since oxygen is in four places, I'm gonna work away from this balanced formula. So now I'm gonna go back and say, well, magnesium needs to be balanced. If there's three magnesiums here, I'm gonna put a three in front of the MGO and balance the magnesiums. And now my last thing I'm gonna do is check the oxygens. So I can see there's three oxygens here. There's eight here, uh, eight and three is 11. On this side here, we have two times four is eight and three is 11. So we, indeed we can see oxygens are balanced. And in my last example, I can see manganese. Just let me get rid of that for a second here. I can see manganese is in two places. Oxygen is in two places. Chlorine is in three places. So chlorine will be the last thing I balance. So magnesium or manganese, sorry, is in, uh, in two places and it looks like it's balanced. Oxygen is only in two places, so I can, I can work with it. If there's two oxygens on the left, the only way I can balance oxygen is by putting a two in front of the H2O, it gives me two oxygens. And also now I can see I've got four hydrogens. Uh, and if I wanna work from this formula, which is partially balanced, I can see four hydrogens. I'm gonna balance four hydrogens by putting a four in front of the HCl. Hydrogens are now balanced. So the last thing we do is balance the chlorine. I've got four chlorines here. So when I check on this side, there's two here and two here. So we need a one in front of the Cl2, it's now balanced. So those are balancing equations. So um, the ones that are more difficult to balance, I have, a, I have an interesting technique I'm gonna show you here, which could be the first time you've ever seen it. So when you're uh, using uh, you can use a chart to balance the equation and you can assign letter coefficients to represent um, the quantities in the balanced equation. We're always going to assign a coefficient of one to the first substance in our unbalanced equation and then we're going to solve for our variables. A little bit confusing, so I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Now, in these equations, sometimes spectator ions are removed. A spectator ion 
is an ion that is present in both reactants and products. So if you remove it, uh, it because it doesn't participate in any chemical change. So <clears throat> now we're gonna solve in our problem here next. So if you get an answer that has a negative answer, it means that substance is on the wrong side of the equation. So we're simply gonna move it to the other side. Okay, so here we go. So we're gonna use the, uh, this method. Now in this particular equation here, notice that we have ions in there and we wanna balance it. <clears throat> it's not easy to balance, just trying the method we previously used. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna assign a value of one for the first coefficient. We're gonna arbitrarily choose the letter A to represent the second coefficient, B for the third, C, D, and E. So now we're gonna solve for A, B, C, D, and E using some simple algebra. Okay, we're gonna make a little table and we're gonna recognize the reactant side has to equal the product side in terms of numbers. And we're gonna balance it for all the atoms present and as well as the charge on this equation. So we can see that here, uh, ni nitrogen, there's one nitrogen on the left. And since the only place where nitrogen is found on the right is here, we can see that one is indeed gonna be equal to D. So <clears throat> we'll make that equation a little bit later. Okay, when you look at oxygen here now, okay, for oxygen, there's gonna be three oxygens in NO3. There's also oxygens in water, but if I change coefficient B, then we're gonna to have to multiply whatever coefficient B is times oxygen, okay? So the amount of oxygens here will be equal to B. And on this side, the amount of oxygens would be equal to D, okay? So we have now established that three plus B is the total amount of oxygens on the reactant side. Again, this half of the table represents reactants, this side products, and D represents the number of oxygens on the product side. Now let's move to copper. Copper, there's A number, whatever number is put here is gonna be the number of coppers on the left. So similarly, C has to be the same as A because whatever number goes here has to be here if we're gonna retain balance. So C and A have to be equal. Now for hydrogen, we can see hydrogen is in, is only in water here. So whatever number we put times uh, for the coefficient for B, we have to multiply it by two to get two B for the number of hydrogens. And on the other side, the only place where hydrogen is here, there's one hydrogen with a charge of one plus. So E will represent the number of hydrogens on the right side. So there are the quantities for hydrogen and reactant and product side. And for charge, a little bit trickier, we have a minus one on this side and we have a plus two on this side. So whatever charge we have for the copper has to be multiplied by two, so two C. And there's also a charge here where whatever coefficient we place here, E has to be multiplied by plus one. So it's really plus E. So the charge here, the total charge on the right would be two C plus E. And the charge on the left would be minus one. Well, now we can make equations, as I've said. So our equations are D really equals one, three plus B really equals D. In the third line, we can say A is equal to C. In the fourth example, fourth line down, we can see two B really equals E. And number five, we can say the charge balance requires that minus one must be equal to two C plus E. So now what we're gonna do is use all these equations to solve for A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, so solving equations from, if we put equation one and two together, since D really equals one, if D is equal to one, three added to what number gives one? Well, we know that number is minus two. Nine minus two added to three gives one. So we've assumed D is equal to two. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question? Okay, any questions there? Okay, I'll keep going. <clears throat> now we're gonna move to the next equation. Now from equation four, we've established that B is really equal to minus two. So E is gonna be two B, well E must be equal to minus two times two. So if two B is really equal to E, 
then E must be equal to minus two. So the next one from equation five, just let me get rid of this. From equation five, we can see that minus one equals two C plus E. But if we know E is equal to minus four, we can substitute minus four in here. And when we do that, we get minus one equals two C minus four. So we solve this equation and we get C is equal to three halves because if we add four to both sides, we get a plus three, and then we divide both sides by two, we get a three halves, there's a fraction there. So we have now effectively solved for all our variables. So we know that C equals A because number three, A was equal to C, and they're both equal to three halves. We know that B is equal to minus two. We know that E is equal to minus four. And we know, so now I'm gonna start putting the values in where they belong. So E is minus four, A is three halves, C is three halves, okay? And B is minus two, let me move that. And now we have an equation, except here's the problem. We have minus quantities, so what do we do? We have to switch sides. So. We're gonna move the negative terms to the opposite side. So we move our waters to the right, our hydrogens to the left. And that's what I've done. I put my coefficients in here. And now we have, an we have a fraction in the equation. And typically to get rid of the fraction, we simply can double everything. So if we double everything, we get rid of the two as a denominator here. Three halves times two is three. Three times four is, <clears throat> yeah, two times four, sorry, is eight. Two times three halves is three two, and four. And we now have a successfully balanced equation here. So using this particular technique. <clears throat> and the, the nice thing about a balanced equation is you know that it's correct. So the last thing I do is check three coppers, three coppers, uh, two nitrogens, two nitrogens, six oxygens, four times one is four plus two, six oxygens, eight hydrogens, four times two, eight hydrogens, and charge. Minus two plus eight is plus six. On the right, plus six, three times pl uh, plus two. So we know our answer is correct. Now, um, here's another equation here that we're gonna do. And you know what? I'm gonna let you guys do this one on your own. Um, so, so I'm gonna switch slides there. So I don't wanna... Uh, I'm gonna let you try that one on your own, okay? And if you have questions with it, the answers are there. Um, I'm gonna continue on here. So <clears throat> in a balanced equation, what it gives us really are the mole relationships that exist between the reactants and products. Uh, and then again, when you have a, a problem that's given where you're given words, the first thing you need to do is write a balanced chemical equation, which is why it's so important to learn the language of chemistry, how to write formulas. So a lot of the questions I'm gonna be giving you in this course will be chemical reactions involving the names of the substances and you'll be required to come up with the formulas. So, so and then we're gonna use that hub diagram I showed you uh, earlier and we're gonna use dimensional analysis with the, with the actual units to ensure we're solving the question correctly. So. And then we're gonna check out a second problem. So here we are. Here's the kind of example that you'll be asked to solve on your next test, not the test today, but the next test, which is I've got scheduled for uh, two weeks from today. So again, potassium chlorate is heated, it decomposes, it makes potassium chloride and oxygen gas. So we are given, uh, we're asked to calculate the mass of potassium chlorate needed to produce 75 liters of oxygen gas at standard temperature and pressure. So what we are going to do first is determine um, the quantity of moles from, uh, we're given STP, so we know the temperature, we know the pressure, we could calculate the number of moles of the substance. This, the starting point is 75 liters at STP, and then you're asked to calculate the mass so we can't go directly from volume to mass, we have to go through the mole. So the first step is gonna to be to find the number of moles of the 
<coughs> oxygen gas, and then we're going to use the balanced equation to figure out the number of moles of potassium chlorate needed. And then we're finally, the last step, we're going to find the mass of potassium chlorate required to produce that volume of gas. Okay, so three steps. So first step, use a balanced equation after uh, solving for the number of moles, and then use uh, the number of moles and the molar mass of potassium chlorate to figure out the mass. So those are the three steps we're going to take. So if I want to do it all in one step, like a lot of times you do in physics problems, so you could substitute equation one into equation two, and you can simply get the mass is equal to PV over RT times M, assuming you've got the balanced chemical equation as well. So here, potassium chlorate, chlorate is ClO3, one minus, potassium is K1 plus, they combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. Potassium chloride, again, is a binary compound. It ends in IDE. So we know that it's chloride is one minus, potassium is one plus. And oxygen gas, remember that oxygen is stable as a diatomic molecule. It's not single particles. So here, when we look at it, when we inspect it, we can see when we balance it, oxygen is not balanced. So to balance it, I can simply use a fraction here if I like. Three halves times two gives me three oxygens, three oxygens. And then the potassium chloride and the potassium chlorate, um, there'll be a one in front of each of them and that'll keep the potassium and the chlorine balanced. So here's our given quantity, 75 liters at 100 kilopascals and 273K. So the number of moles of oxygen is PV over RT. We're gonna use the, the uh, combined gas law uh, uh, equation. A VP equals NRT, we rearrange it. So the number of moles of oxygen is the pressure, 100 kilopascals times the volume, 75 liters. Since R is on the bottom, we're gonna write 8.31, and R is the units are kilopascal liters uh, per mole Kelvin. When we divide by R, we're multiplying by the reciprocal. So we flip flop the kilopascal liter per mole Kelvin, and we put the denominator mole Kelvin in the on the top in this case and the temperature is is uh, standard temperature and pressure is 273 kelvin so when we do the math we multiply it out we get 3.304 moles of oxygen now let's talk for a second about significant digits there's only two significant digits here so we kept extra digits as long as you keep one extra digit and you don't round you won't get a rounding error so I recommend keeping, in this case, keep at least three significant digits to avoid a rounding error. So now we look at our balanced chemical equation. Well, it shows three halves of a mole of oxygen is produced from one mole of potassium chlorate. So if you wanted to get rid of the fraction, you could simply double this and then double that. So it's a two to three ratio any way you look at it. So three moles of oxygen, uh, is made from two moles of potassium chlorate. So, so to get the number of moles of, pota of oxygen converted into potassium chlorate, we have to multiply by two thirds. So, and that's what we do here. Okay, we're going to take the number of moles of oxygen, multiply by two moles of potassium, two moles of potassium chlorate divided by three moles of oxygen. And I did that by again doubling two, two, and three. Just makes the math a little easier. Okay, and we get the number of moles of potassium chlorate produced, um, required, sorry, to produce the oxygen. And my last step now will be to convert the moles uh, into mass because it says calculate the mass in the question. We do that by finding the molar mass of potassium chlorate. One mole of potassium chlorate equals a mole of potassium, a mole of chlorine, and three moles of oxygen. So we're gonna multiply by the molar mass of potassium chlorate. And that gives us our final answer. Notice again in the question, there's only two significant digits. The answer only requires two significant digits. So I have to write in scientific notation to demonstrate that I understand the answer only can have two significant digits. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about limiting reagents here. In a chemical reaction, frequently you have measured quantities of both reactants and one of those reactants will invariably get used up first. And that 
reactant, when it runs out, will literally stop the chemical reaction from happening. So the one that runs out limits the amount of product that's produced. So we call it a limiting reagent, okay? So again, let's talk about it. So there is an example in Petrucci. If uh, you want to take a look at it after the lecture, you can take a look at it. It's 4-12, shows how another way of how it's done. So here, I'm gonna show you how it's done in this example. So calcium oxide, reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce calcium chloride in water. If 60.4 grams of calcium oxide and 69 grams of hydrochloric acid are added, reaction proceeds until one of the reactants runs out. What mass of calcium chloride is formed? So my first step is to write the formulas. So calcium is a plus two ox. Oxide means binary compound. Oxygen is a minus two. They combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. Hydrochloric acid, is simply hydrogen and chlorine. There's five binary acids that you need to know the formula of. There's hydrochloric, hydrofluoric, hydroiodic, hydrobromic. Um, they're all the halogens. They are all minus one. Whenever you take these, uh, hy like hydrogen chloride gas and dissolve it in water, you get hydrochloric acid. We, it, the difference between hydrogen chloride gas and hydrochloric acid is indicated by the aqueous symbol here. So that's the terminology we use in chemistry to indicate an acid versus a gas. Now, it produces, in this case, calcium chloride. Calcium's a positive two, chlorine's a minus one, and uh, water. So when we balance it, we can see there are two hydrogens on the right. We're gonna balance it by putting a two in front of the HCl. And that effectively, there's two chlorines, two chlorines, one calcium, one calcium. We can see the ratio here. One mole of calcium oxide is going to require two moles of HCl. So our first step will be to figure out which reactant is limiting. So we have 60.4 grams of calcium oxide. We have 69 grams of hydrochloric acid. What we're going to do is first figure out how many moles each of those is, and then figure out the limiting reagent use, using the coefficients in the balanced equation. Once we know the limiting reagent, we're going to use the moles of limiting reagent to calculate the mass of calcium chloride by simply saying, whichever is a limiting reagent, if it's calcium oxide, the limiting reagent, the number of moles of calcium chloride will be the same. If it's hydrochloric acid that's a limiting reagent, the number of moles of calcium chloride produced will be half as much. So let's go and figure out the limiting reagent. So to do that, we're going to take 60.4 grams of calcium oxide and divide it by the molar mass, we get 1.07 moles of calcium oxide. For the second one, we take the 69 grams of hydrochloric acid, we divide it by the 36.45 grams, which is a molar mass of hydrochloric acid, and we get 1.893 moles of HCl. So what we have to decide now is what the limiting reagent is. Well, we can see one mole of, of calcium oxide requires two moles of HCl. So is there enough HCl to use up all the calcium oxide? Okay, or we could say we could go the other way. It doesn't really matter. So we've already established one mole of calcium oxide requires two moles of HCl. So if I have 1.07 moles of calcium oxide, I'm gonna need twice as many moles of hydrochloric acid to use it all up. Well, clearly we don't have enough hydrochloric acid because Two times 1.07 is 2.14. There isn't enough hydrochloric acid to use up all the calcium oxide. So if there isn't, if all the calcium oxide isn't going to get used up, we have to use up the hydrochloric acid. That's how I figure out limiting reagent. So, <clears throat> so we've just decided there wasn't enough hydrochloric acid to use up all the calcium oxide. So we're gonna use up all hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid is the limiting reagent. So now we're, we're basically this quantity, 1.07 moles of CaO. If you're doing a question on a test, you could basically put an X through it or just through it, put a line through it and put a box around this quantity right here. Cause that's the quantity we're gonna use now to figure out the calcium chloride produced. So, now we say the number of moles of calcium chloride is going to be a ratio of one to two because a hydrochloric acid is a limiting reagent. 
So we take the number of moles of HCl and we divide it by two, we get 0.9465 moles of calcium chloride. And then my final step to convert it into mass, we multiply by the molar mass of calcium chloride. And we get an answer 105 grams of calcium chloride. Now the quantities given in the question, the masses were three significant digits. Again, my answer has three significant digits. Okay. Now there's a, there's a sheet of uh, questions there that you can practice in the uh, course pack. Make sure you do. <clears throat> if you require additional practice other than what's included in the course pack, simply fire me an email. I will fire you more questions with answers if you require them, okay? Now the next topic I'm gonna to cover is percentage yield. So chemical reactions, in theory, you can calculate the ideal quantities that are gonna be produced. For instance, in the last example we just gave, if we actually carried out this chemical reaction using these two quantities, the theoretical quantity of calcium chloride produced would be 105 grams. But guess what? In the real world, you probably wouldn't make 105 grams. You probably would make less than that because of errors involved or impurities or other aspects that cause problems. Now, you could also inadvertently introduce other substances to the reaction mixture that could actually give you more than you're expected. In that case, the percent yield would be more than 100%. So we're gonna talk as engineers, it's important when you work for uh, industries, they're gonna wanna maximize the percent yield to get closest they can to the theoretical quantities predicted by the theory. So <clears throat> we're gonna now talk about how we could get, what I was talking about was a theoretical yield, which was what the problem gives you, and the actual yield is the amount that's actually obtained. So percent yield is always the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. In the example I just gave, the amount we expect, 105 grams, would have been the theoretical yield. If we get less than that, our percent will be lower than 100%. If we get more, it's going to be greater than 100%. So here's our next example here. So again, in calcium chloride, we talked about the 105 grams it was supposed to produce theoretically. Suppose you only got 78 grams that actually was made. Well, percentage yield would simply be the 78 grams, the actual amount divided by the theoretical amount, which is what we calculated, and we get a 74% yield. And that's percentage, how we calculate percentage yield. Okay. Now your suggested homework, um, again, are all those question sheets that are in the course pack. You need to do them before the next test. And there's also a, a tricky problem that's in the course pack. Make sure you try it because we're gonna give you some tricky questions now and then, all right? It, it, it requires you to kind of do your due diligence and do the practice. You can only learn so much from watching me. You have to actually do it to, uh, to learn how to solve these problems. So, so I'm just going to stop, uh, stop right now, guys, and uh, re-invite you because I'm going to record this. I don't, we don't need to record answers. Okay, so I'm going to simply um, stop recording right now. Let me see here. Uh,